So we'll get started. This is uh, our second candidates forum. Uh, my name is Ryan Sin. I'm the, I'm the chair of the Citizens Committee here in Springwood Park. We started this committee last year as a way to kind of have the citizens communicate with each other and get involved and know what's going on in government outside of the actual city government. Um, we've been uh, meeting once a month on the third Tuesday. Usually here it's at the city hall. Uh, it just depends. Yeah, by the way, everybody cell phones off. Good. That'd be great. Um, and we've been meeting, you know, the third Tuesday, and uh, really it's kind of an open forum. We want to just get people involved, have the candidates be informed, inform ourselves about what's going on in the city, and uh, kind of uh, have an outlet for citizens to kind of discuss issues in the city, whether it's crime or street lights or potholes or whatever it happens to be. So um, with that, we're going to get started. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be wrapped up by 8, 8.30. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how we've got four candidates. Uh, what we're going to do, guys, if you're all okay with it, is we'll keep the responses to three minutes or less. Um, Ken here will be our timekeeper. He's got three signs, a one-minute sign, a 30-second sign, and a stop sign. We'd like to ask, you know, once you hit the stop, if you can just finish your sentence, and we'll wrap it up there. Um, we are taking questions from the audience tonight. So Connie in the back uh, will take uh, questions. She has cards and pens. So if you'd like to ask a question, we will try to integrate those in as we can. And we already have some questions. If they're similar to what we already are going to ask, we probably won't ask it, but we'll let you know. Um, either way, uh, does anybody have any questions? For No? OK, well, welcome. Thank you for coming. And um, at this time, uh, we're going to have, we're going to have this, we have the four slips for the candidates. We're going to have the candidates draw to see who will uh, answer the first question first. Take out five and six. Okay. <laughs> I'll take six. <laughs> I, I think so, yeah, you just right with that. Thank you. Can we direct a question to um, to a certain candidate? You know, we're kind of, we're, I think you, you you could maybe say I'd like this question to be answered by this person first, but I think we'll allow everybody to, to answer the question. Um, if that seems fair. Uh, so who's got number one? Like your number one. Two. <laughs> Three. Oh. <laughs> All right, with that, we'll just have, uh, if you guys could just introduce yourselves, uh, give a little brief synopsis of, uh, of you and your candidacy, and then we'll move forward to questions. Sure. My name is Tony Easter. I'm a 17-year resident of Spring Lake Park. Uh, my wife has lived here for 20 years. Uh, matter of fact, um, her closing date was on the Halloween blizzard. Mm -hmm. Back in 91, so <laughs> good, good way to remember that uh, time she moved here. Um, running for uh, city council, um, started just from discussions with around the family table, and, and my family knew that I had, uh, for a while, interest in, in politics and uh, what goes on in the city, just, just with a busy schedule and, and life, just didn't jump into it, and this year they decided you have to do it, so... I decided to throw my hat in the rig and, and uh, give it a try. Thank you. Jason. Well, I'm Jason Letourneau. Uh, I'm a resident for 32 years. Uh, my parents, uh, my father's actually been here since the uh, mid-60s. Uh, the rest of my family uh, has been in the lower part of Blaine and uh, some of Spring Park. Uh, my wife and I uh, have four children. Uh, we, they all attend the Spring Park School District. And uh, I got involved about eight years ago in planning and zoning. That's, uh, I sort of sort of moved on from there and uh, have moved towards uh, city council and uh, I did run for mayor two years ago. Thank you, Jason. Bob? Uh, my name is Bob Nelson. Uh, I've lived in the city my whole life, 53 years. Uh, my wife the same, uh, high school sweethearts. Went to Spring Lake Park. I have two boys, Jess and Josh, both attended Spring Lake Park, graduated. Um, I got into politics in 2000, ran for city council as your council member for four years. After that, I went to two years of planning and zoning, and then I went to four years as your mayor. Uh, fell in love with the 
politics, the city, the interest, the learning, and that. And um, after two years off, I decided to hop back in and see if, uh, what we can do. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, my name is Larry Ram. I've been a resident of Spring Lake Park now for 30 years. My children, Lisa, Mark, Janelle, Kyle, all lived in Spring Lake Park. Went to schools here. My wife Rose is with us tonight. Um, most of my education is in uh, technical training and some college. Uh, I'm a transplant from Wisconsin, still back for campus for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, recently retired about three years ago. Uh, my uh, business that I was in was in the fire protection contracting business. Um, I felt that uh, it was time to give back to the city a little bit of some civic duty, if at all possible. I'm, uh, I go to St. Timothy's Church and I'm going to get down there Thank you. All right, so uh, we'll be able to questions. And again, if you have any questions at the end of, uh, during the forum tonight, you can hand them back to Connie or go pick up paper from her, raise your hand, she'll find you. Um, so our first question is going to go to Tony. And uh, Tony, um, could you uh, tell me what you believe is the most pressing issue facing the residents of Spring Lake Park that can be addressed by the City Council? Uh, I believe the uh, most pressing issue uh, today, uh, despite uh, probably a lot of the press around the municipal liquor, is uh, the vacancies that we're seeing throughout the city, whether that's through to foreclosures um, or any other th uh, any other life changing event that has impacted the residents. Um, those foreclosures are impacting the city financially, and we're no longer getting the local government aid uh, that's been cut off. Uh, so, as a city, we need to look at other opportunities and other ways to bring in. Uh, revenue so that uh, we can avoid uh, increasing taxes on our residents. I think that's the last thing we want to do in an economic situation that we have where uh, money's tight, everybody's you know, struggling, uh, a lot of families struggling paycheck to paycheck. Um, even my family has gone through that for a period of time. Um, so I think that is our, our biggest issue. It, it's one that uh, when you're driving down the streets, you, you probably don't see that often um, because I think uh, the city does a pretty good job of, of making those, uh, the banks or, or whoever the owners are of those vacant lots uh, and empty buildings uh, take care of them. But every, every vacant home that we have, every, um, <coughs> excuse me, every business that we have that's a business building uh, that sits empty is uh, lost revenue to the city through the, the taxation base that we have. So we need to look at ways of, of really bringing more people into the city. Uh, Springley Park is a wonderful place to live. I definitely wouldn't be here for 17 years. Uh, so if there's any way we could work with uh, local agencies, banks, uh, whoever those uh, owners uh, currently are of those properties, uh, to try and inspire them to uh, get those vacancies filled. Uh, that's the direction we, we really should look towards as a city. Thank you. Um, Jason, do you have a uh, response to the question? Are we asking for rebuttals? Or? Uh, no, no. Just, uh, just uh, the same question. Oh, uh, answer that one. Yeah. Uh, I think as far as uh, I'm concerned, that the, the foreclosures are an interesting issue. Uh, it was quite the, the head two years ago. Uh, I think that uh, as the council, current council has, seated, has said that the budget itself is probably the most important and probably our primary use of money. Uh, I think that finding a way to, and as the current administration has done, is finding ways to cut the tax budget. Um, they found that uh, if have been able to take 26% of the current budget out, um, my worries are where did the money go? How were we able to trim out so much money? Uh, and in doing so, what services have we lost in doing so? So my, my feeling for the most important thing right now is to find out what services we're going to be losing as, as a result of a 26% tax cut, and uh, what bonds were put aside in order to achieve a $700,000 budget change. Thank you. Uh, Bob, do you have an answer to the most pressing issue in the city? <coughs> well, again, it, it's money and taxes. That's always what's at the uh, heart of everybody's mind. Um, 
weathering a storm out and waiting for the market to recorrect itself because you're pretty much at the mercy of the market, what's happening in the state and the federal level, which is trickling down to foreclosures, so on and so forth. Uh, putting in plans like we did six years ago or so, uh, working with the county and developing the EDA HRA fund where we can work with the county and have uh, interest rate money and so on and so forth to fix these houses up was a great step. We've used it a little bit already in the city for one piece of property off Osborne, the old tow truck place, uh, help develop that, keep it a new tenant to move in, new owner to move in, then a tax base up there, built some buildings which helped. Uh, now if we can do something with the housing and that will get it up because the vacant foreclosed housing is really affecting what your sale is on your house. That was your lifelong investment. That's what most people are looking at. We've always watched the dimes and the nickels pretty good. I mean, uh, there are concerns. Anytime you cut too much, you might lose services. But uh, weathering it out and working with the bankers and the realtors uh, to, to market the city is probably the way to go there and keep all your basic functions that you have already. <coughs> Thanks, Bob. Uh, Larry? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't want to sound like a, like a record of anybody playing here, but, but it kind of sounds like that's the key note to it. it. It is tax, of course. You know. um, uh, we all live in neighborhoods where we have vacant homes. Um, 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 you know, with the vacancies and the foreclosures and things of that nature that are going, um, of course, that takes away from uh, taxes to the city, which, which uh, uh, taking in revenue, of course, is going to be less. Uh, but one of the things that I really liked in, the, in this particular city, and I would be a to make sure it continues to stay that way, and it's a pressure, pressing issue for me is, is public safety. Public safety to me is number one in this city. Uh, everybody wants to be safe at home. Um, uh, the budget that we've created, or I should say the city of the mayor has created here, is a $3.4 million budget this particular year, and 44% of that budget is going to, uh, to the police department. And, and with that kind of money of $1.5 million every year, I think it's a continuance of uh, uh, making sure that uh, our money with budget is continually spending wisely. And I think that's one of the areas where we're going to do it. Thank you. Um, we'll go to the next question. I had one announcement. I'm sorry, I forgot that uh, Bill Nash had, um, had let me know and had let people know that he had an emergency and, and wasn't going to be able to make it here tonight. So he did plan on attending, but uh, it's unavailable. So. Um, and our second question, and this one goes to Bob first. Um, if you were elected to city council, how would you maintain interaction and communication with the residents of the city? Well, I walk a little over two miles every day through the city, and I talk to every neighbor I do see out there. Interaction, a newsletter, uh, I would like to see about four times a year, the supplements coming in between. I think that's a great way. Uh, to get the word across. Um, it's funny that uh, when you go talk to people, a lot of them just think about the state and the federal level and the government that affects their lives the most from day to day from the time they get up in the morning and use their bathroom facilities with the city and water and sewer and the city and the public works club in the streets so that you can get to work and back, sidewalks done so our children can get back and forth to school safely. Uh, uh, there's about what they like to talk about. Um, county council meetings uh, has always been very difficult. You get in the press with the newspaper, newspaper articles, and people are steamed up, but nobody comes to me and you'll sit there for 10 years. I got two people in the audience, three people in the audience. So that, that's a really good question, and after all those years, I really don't know what kind of fire you can light them up <coughs> get them to come in and really want to pay attention. So we've done a good deal with it in the past. Um, some improvements is just more newsletters. Hopefully they read them. Thank you. Um, and the second question, or the second response goes to uh, Larry. Well, information is number one of the residents. They want to know what's going on in the community and your, in your city. Uh, Nowadays, we got social media out there. I mean, it, it's not difficult to get a hold of people. You've got, you've got uh, everybody seems to have computers, emails, uh, Facebook. Uh, uh, one of the things that, that I really like in the city is the, uh, is the newsletter that comes out for it. There's, there's just a vast amount of information that's in the 
really keep you up to date as to what's really going on. I think as far as communicating with people in your neighborhood, I think you have to you have to get to know your neighbors. You know, um, uh, one of the important events of the year, of course, is the, is the night out that we have. And, and I think it's important for people to make sure that they walk around, they talk to people, know what's going on, get to know people within it, and uh, uh, keep involved. And also the uh, open houses that are always going to be available from the fire department to the police department to the city hall. And the council people are always available for any questions. So uh, I don't think it's difficult to get information to people if people think it is. I just think if I was uh, elected, I would make sure that uh, I was I was visible. I would be. Uh, I would make myself available for people. I would give them my email address. I would uh, give them my Facebook if they wanted it. And if they had questions and answers, I'd be more than happy. To probably try to respond to Thank you. And uh, let's go to you, Jason. And then I think that the the issue isn't with being able to contact the residents. I think it's a, a matter of finding enough self service in the city that. Uh, residents need to be able to access the information from the city itself uh, through email yes uh, through the actual web page which actually has increased quite a bit over the last few years it's actually become a lot more informative you can actually find the council rebroadcast but we've found that there's far more using satellite now than using the cable television and not that I'm knocking cable television but there is no access to the general government channel on satellite access for Sprawling Park uh, I think that trying to get that somehow coordinated with Spring Lake Park or even the surrounding cities to actually broadcast through satellite also so that people can still sit at home and watch what's going on in their city. Uh, the great loss of, we switched over to satellite, we lost the ability to watch the, the government channels. So we can't even watch the councils, but I can still hop on a day and a half later and see the, the rebroadcast of the council meetings. So I think that making the city a little more available through uh, technology, uh, whether it's social media, I mean, I know the city has its own Facebook page, they have their own web page, but having the information that people are asking for brought and put electronically so that people can access it. Somebody wants uh, the, the meeting minutes from last meeting because they wanted to read through something that they didn't understand or somebody brought something up, that's not available. I'd like to push to have more of that technology brought into our city for a very little cost. It, it's a matter of time and scanning ability. And that's, we've started to do it with the agendas, but the agendas are you know, falling two or three weeks behind. So that you can't get the agenda for tonight's meeting, but you'll be able to watch the rebroadcast in two days. So that's where I would look for it. Thank you. And uh, Tony? Yes. Um, technology is a great way to communicate, uh, specifically with the younger generation. Uh, younger generation, they enjoy being able to access information on their cell phones or laptops, tablets, uh, you name the device, they love to access the information that way. So I would like to see us move in that direction of more information uh, at their fingertips, because that's, that's what they prefer. But I myself, I'm an old-fashioned person. Um, I would like to see, uh, see us have a meeting in the neighborhoods, uh, schedule a time, maybe give up one of the council evenings, and actually meet in the neighborhoods and talk talk to the citizens and residents of Spring Lake Park outside of these four walls. Come and meet you in your place and find out what's, you know, what's on your mind, what, what issues do you see in the city, and then that way, through body language, just through talk and communication, what you may be experiencing, uh, someone two or three, four doors uh, or houses away may be experiencing the same thing. Then we can <coughs> also work together to address that. Um, I like the newsletter. Uh, but for me, um, after seeing the newsletter for <coughs> 17 years, <laughs> it's, it's a repeat of the same information every quarter. Um, I almost have it memorized. <coughs> it's like, okay, this is about snow days. You know, this is about you know, making sure you're not parking on the street. I, I pretty much have it memorized. And it's great for new residents. But I'd like to see more information in that uh, about other activities, other things that are going on in our city uh, that could be communicated. Uh, so I, I would like to see us expand it uh, instead of doing quarterly, maybe bi-monthly, uh, every two months. Um, and uh, if budget uh, allows, even monthly, uh, I believe we have a pretty active community where things can be communicated uh, almost on a monthly basis. But I would start with maybe every two months and, and see how that works. 
Thanks. Um, so the next question, we're going to go Jason, Larry, Tony, and then Bob uh, for the answer. This is a two-part question, so we'll have to follow up after we ask the initial question. Uh, the initial question is, what do you believe is the role of private businesses within the boundaries of the city? And <clears throat> to give you a specific thing, or a few specific things that you could elaborate on are, how do you feel about used car lots, pawn shops, hookah lounges, and uh, that, at that point, um, Jason? So you're asking, let me just clarify the question. Yep. You're asking what do I feel is the, what is private businesses' role in the city? Yeah, what do you feel is their purpose or role or their position within the city of Stanley Park, the boundaries, geographical? Well, um, I'll try and attack that question. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, very philosophical. I think it, 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 maybe part of what you're asking is the private businesses in Stanley Park are there to generate revenue tax-wise, as the residents are. Um, obviously at a higher rate than the residents pay. Um, but it also to supply services. Um, and there are some certain services that people want on a daily basis, weekly basis, and yearly basis. You know, hopping to the gas station that's three blocks away from me is always a great thing. I can send my kids down to the gas station to, to get some milk. You know, that's a very nice thing. So I like having that kind of private business. Uh, moving into car dealerships, I've always used Friendly Chevrolet for my vehicles, and I have for 20 years. Uh, I like that they're local. I like that I can go over there and, and find the same guys that have been working there for 20 years. I like that availability, and I like that uh, friendliness that I get from them. Um, you're asking about different groups of people who aren't actually in the city, hookah lounges uh, or uh, smoke shops. Um, it's a difference of opinion. It's a difference of label. Um, but it's the same thing. A smoke shop is still available. It's still a service that the city, you know, is requesting. Not the city administration or the council, but residents, obviously, that still smoke. They don't want to pay the high tax prices at a gas station, so they want to go to a smoke shop and buy their cigarettes there. So if that's the private interest that you're looking for. Uh, used car dealerships, is there too many or not enough? Uh, I don't know. I, and I didn't know there were 12 when we were first told it. Uh, is it too many? Uh, apparently it is now, um, but I'm not the one to make the decision. I'm not the one that, you know, is constantly frequently. I frequent three different car dealerships that I go to in, in Spring Lake Park itself. Uh, well, one is across the street in Fridley, but it's still, is there a second part to that question? Uh, the second part to the question is, um, do you have a particular criteria of what you would be for or against in terms of a business being in the city of Spring Lake Park? Politically or personally, well, I do run I do run a design business that does design for just about everyone that you could imagine, <laughs> from daycares to hookah lounges to senior skilled and nursing homes. So, uh, on a personal level, I don't believe that the city should be strong arming certain businesses that are looking to come in. Yes, there are certain ones that you know no one wants. They don't want exotic bookstores. They don't want strip clubs in their city. Those sort of businesses are not welcome in the city and we have ordinance to protect that. Um, do I believe that car dealerships should have a limitation to how many there should be in the city? Only as much space as we have, they still pay the taxes. I think you've kind of answered the gist of what I think okay. we're looking for with that. So, um, uh, Larry? Well, pretty much the same thing. I think the role is for a, a, a business and private business within Springlight Park is to, to, to bring some revenue into the city and to System and how to uh, uh, run the city operations. As far as uh, 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 availability of services <coughs> for every citizen's needs, whether it's uh, going out and buying a pack of cigarettes or going to buy a car, I think uh, as far as certain types of business, I would agree with, with Jason. I, you know, who wants to see a massage parlor within Springland Park with our children? You know, there's certain ones, but uh, uh, I wouldn't close the door on all businesses. I would, Apparently, nobody would, but, but there are certain businesses that I would really be careful about allowing within the city. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Tony? I, I'd have to agree with uh, <laughs> so far. The purpose of businesses is to generate revenue, but also uh, to pay health uh, with the tax basis of the, of the city. Um, as far as the type of businesses that would come in, um, absolutely, I think that is part of the responsibility of the council and administration of the city to um, keep a watchful eye for the residents and uh, 
making sure that the businesses are not coming in, such as massage parlors or exotic dance clubs, those type of things, things that um, may taint the reputation and uh, the reputation of not only the city but also of the residents. Uh, so I would definitely uh, lean more that direction of, of having some type of um, uh, not litmus test, but definitely uh, follow the ordinances and things like that to make sure those type of businesses are not uh, in Sperling Park. Okay. Um, and Bob? <coughs> well, um, most of what we could do legally has already been done in the city. We are a statutory <coughs> city. Um, we have ordinances in places where food and don't feed you know, the strip joints and bookstores and so on and so forth. That does fall under what we can do as a statutory city. Um, as far as eliminating car lots, different things like that, state statute is there and protects these businesses and gives them a place the city cannot go against the state statute. And this is what I'm trying to get at. So a lot of the other businesses, unless you can prove it's a a bad idea, a description, which nobody wants. Your, your hands are tied. If it's zoned commercial, light industrial, or business district, under those guidelines, if they want to move in, you pretty much have to let them do it because you're held there by state statute. Okay. Do you have a vote? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> I'd, like to keep, I'd like to keep going. I just I wanted to clarify a situation. The, the massage parlor idea, I mean, it means different things now. Uh, there still are massage parlors there that are not the right exactly. Now. They're not they're not exotic. I mean, well, I just wanted to clarify that we, I don't think anyone here is thinking that the, the normal where I go see my masseuse right, is right. not the one we're talking about. <laughs> we're actually talking about the exotic parlors that right. So that's the only rebuttal I had was to help well, clarify we, that. Yeah. We do have we do have two massage parlors in the city that yeah. I'm aware of. One is just south of the city. One across the <laughs> across the highway. <laughs> and if you uh, came to that at that time and uh, you know, to protect the citizens and what this do, uh, they did a background check with the police department. Everything was clarified that there would be no prostitution or anything. It was therapeutic massage, not the other type. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that has always been addressed. We can move on to something a little more wholesome. Um, so for this question, it's going to go to Larry first, and then Bob, and then Tony, and then Jason. Um, at a recent city council meeting, city staff presented the city council with a department head service agreement in which the city department has requested, in among other things, six months of severance if their employment was terminated for any reason other than misconduct. How would you have voted on this issue as a member of the city council and why? I don't know what's on that. <laughs> uh, I mean, first of all, um, I look at the, the city of Sperling Park as you know, sometimes it's a business. You know, they hire, they hire people to do full-time jobs. Thank you. They're hired to do the jobs that uh, they're, they're hired to do the job that they're hired to do. They get fringe benefit packages. They get vacation. They get uh, health. They get everything that probably in the private sector everybody else gets. As far as the uh, six month seventh package goes, no, I don't. I don't believe that it should be uh, uh, granted. And the reason for it is because I think it's eventually going to end up being a. Uh, 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 it's going to be. It's going to cost the city uh, money for one thing. If, if one of these persons had to get let go, and the reason I bring that up, I mean, why do people get let go? I mean, it is, if, if they were to get fired, why would you give somebody mm -hmm. a six-month severance package if they were fired? They were, they were let go for a specific reason. Um, uh, and if, in fact, you, you, you fired somebody and you give somebody a six-month severance package like that, you're probably going to open yourself up to a lawsuit anyways if you're, if you're going to release somebody for no just cause. So, no, I don't agree. I, I, I disagree with the uh, severance package. Thank you, and uh, Bob? Uh, I don't think he could have said it much better, absolutely not. Um, you, again, <laughs> uh, with labor and the labor laws, you're pretty much restricted under the state. 
and you've got to have pretty good justification to get rid of anybody, usually gross insubordination, misconduct, something like that. Um, the part of it that intrigued me was uh, as we restructure and cut wages down, maybe fall in line more with the other cities throughout the, the state of Minnesota and the other cities to get their salaries in line with what everybody's doing with the way the economy is right now. And if they're not happy with that, they can quit. I understood this portion right and request the six month severance pay is absurd. It's just completely absurd. Um, just because you work for a municipality, the state government, a school, anything like that, and oh, I serve the children or I serve the public, if there's a reason for you to be let go, then you take care of business and you shouldn't have your hands tied. I have come up with six months back. Thanks. And uh, Tommy? I, I agree with what's been said already. Uh, <coughs> 17 years in, in working in, in a corporate environment, um, I, I've never heard of someone being let go or receiving a severance, unless it, especially if it's under misconduct or, or, or something like that. Um, even if it's not misconduct, if they're let go. Um, I haven't heard of anyone receiving the severance. The only time I've heard of that happening in the corporate world is when people are being laid off. If, their job, if there's a job reduction, then I've heard of, the, of uh, individuals being offered some type of severance package. But um, I think uh, this kind of sets a bad precedent uh, for, for uh, and actually it almost, um, in a way, kind of rewards <laughs> uh, the behavior or, or the action that has taken place. So I, I definitely disagree with uh, giving the six-month severance. Okay. Uh, and Jason? Do you should read, read the question for me. <clears throat> yeah, the, the question is, and, and I was going to say, if, the question is, at a recent city council meeting, city staff presented the city council with a department head service agreement in which the city department heads requested six months of severance if their employment was termi terminated without misconduct. So if they, if they did do misconduct, they, they don't receive the severance if that's proven. Okay. I think we kind of drift, I, 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 and that's why I asked to repeat the question. I think we kind of drifted off. No one wants, if you have a bad employee, of course you're going to terminate the person and you're not going to pay them six months salary. I'm fairly certain that in their contract, there is a clause that says that if you are terminated through insubordination or gross misconduct, that you would lose your severance package. And I think that's a fairly standard clause in all the government <coughs> and our city's contracts. I'm not sure. I haven't read them. Um, but And that's where you're saying that it, if you're let go, and they, this probably is relating to the idea of the liquor store contracts where someone was let go through no fault of their own. The position was dropped. They had nowhere to go. And they've been working there for 10 years. What do they do? Does the city kick out six months in order to find that person or have that person find a job for 75%, 50% of their original pay? Um, I believe that it is right to allow that and to attract uh, new blood into the city. That is, uh, you know, a severance contract, if that ties people to the job, that we promise not to fire you unless you are grossly insubordinate, that we want you to come here. And that if something happens, budget cuts happen, and you lose your job, that we're willing to commit to you six months for your years of service. Does anyone have to rewrite the question? Anybody else want to clarify anything on that? I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to clarify. Yeah, if it's, if it's um, as what was just explained, their positions eliminated. Um, or there's some type of staff reduction. It, it makes perfect sense then, absolutely. <coughs> Especially based on years of service. If they've, if they've been in, with the city for 10 years, 20 years, absolutely. Um, but I, I think cool. I misunderstood the question and, and brought the misconduct okay. into it. So. No problem. Um, our next question will, will go to uh, Tony then Jason then Bob and then Larry. Um, the city recently voted to revoke the senior citizen's water rate discount, which waived the administrative fee and the first three nine thousand gallons that senior citizens were receiving. How would you have voted on this issue in mind? Knowing, <laughs> uh, knowing a lot of the citizens um, that I've met in Spring Park, I I would have voted uh, 
No, I, I'm eliminating that. Um, senior citizens, um, it, it's, the times are tough and they're getting hit also. And to eliminate uh, that uh, discount for them um, kind of kind of takes away from their means of paying for other things uh, that they need. I, I would have kept it in. Uh, not sure. I, I don't know the numbers, but I'm not sure how much more revenue that would have brought in for the city. But um, I, I've met, uh, as I've gone door to door, some seniors uh, in our city that have been here 30, 40, 50 years. And to me, that's just a way of honoring them and saying, you know, thank you for being a part of our city for so long. But then to have that taken away, I, I don't see what that would have bought us as a city. Okay. Thanks. And, uh, Jason? Uh, I also would have voted against it. Um, I, I would have voted to keep it. Excuse me. Voted to keep, keep it. <laughs> <laughs> voted against the bill to cut out the seniors' <laughs> discount. Uh, you know, the simple fact is it's, you know, we're talking a quarterly bill that comes out and it was a matter of 7 to $11 per household. Or per person in this case is the majority of these ones that were being uh, retaxed were single families uh, or, or single owners. Um, by doing so, I mean, I don't know, again, the numbers, the total number of households that it affected, um, but again, it was it was sort of a free ride. You were living here for 30 and 40 years, or even if you've moved in and you've chosen this as your place of residence for the rest of your life, um, I don't think that it's a big dip into our budget that uh, a seven dollar fee is something that you should have to pay. And if you're not using more than nine thousand gallons a, a year, uh, I don't believe that that's an issue. Uh, I mean, I know people who water their grass that use a far more than nine thousand gallons a year just to water the grass. It's a quarter. A quarter. Oh, par oh, pardon me, a quarter. Excuse me. All right, um, and uh, Bob. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It should have never been taken away from the seniors or the handicapped people in the city. Um, it's something that was there. It was really frustrating. At one time, it was 18,000 gallons that they did have for free. And it got reduced to 9,000 gallons in the months about the same time we did the restructuring of the water bills and services because of the Water Conservation Act that was thrown upon us on its federal level. Um, in these times, when the seniors I talk to have sixty, eighty, ninety dollars left at the end of the month after they pay all their bills, because a lot of our seniors are old seniors, um, they're before four hundred one k's, IRAs, and everything else were offered by businesses. All they have is their social security. That's all they got. They ain't got this fund that was set up at their work to have. This hurt them. And I, I, I don't think it was right. It was a very hard decision when the council in the past went from 18,000 to 9,000. We did do a survey. 90% of the seniors fell into 9,000 or less. So the impact when we went there only affected a small majority of the senior citizens. Thanks, Bob. And uh, Larry? Well, I'm saying, no, no I, I would not help uh, revoke that. The uh, senior citizen discount, I don't know exactly what the dollar amount was that the city picked up by revoking <coughs> um, it. It's got to be, be peanuts compared to what the budget is. Um, I think all it created was a whole lot of bad feelings from the seniors towards the, uh, towards the city in regards to that nature. Um, uh, you know, so I guess everybody's already spoke in regards to it and I would never have to be it. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question is going to go to Bob, uh, then Larry, then Jason, and then Tony. Um, does everybody feel like this format is working out all right? Is this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, this question is a little bit longer. It's kind of like one of those math story questions, a train going this way, a train going that way. So you get a piece of paper. Oh. You're going to have to listen a little bit. Um, the city approved the replacement of one of the sewer service lift stations for $700,000. The city has now announced um, recently this year that they will have to replace the other station, lift station in the city for another $700,000. The city had the option to choose 
to replace both lift stations with $350,000 lift stations, which would have to be serviced by contractors, or purchase the $1.4 million worth of lift stations and keep the station serviced by city staff. Should the city focus its resources on contracting services and reducing the city government footprint, um, or keep the services and maintenance in-house? And that question goes to Bob. Well, this is a little bit of a surprise. I didn't know this was happening in the city. I know we just replaced a lift station over by Biff's. Um, one of the things that's nice is that we have two city workers that live in the city of Spring Lake Park, and when we did have a breakdown, if, even if something happened to the, the generator, the backup, uh, they were there to make sure the generator and the backup uh, was operating. Uh, the worst nightmare residents could have is that that lift station did not work and the sewage started <laughs> backing up through the floor drains in their houses and their basements and it would be a complete nightmare. Um, I feel very comfortable with the staff and how well they've maintained it and could respond quick because we do have them living right in the city and, and in very close proximity, proximity to the city. So. Um, not knowing the rest of the dollar figures and where that's going, I would rather keep it on the city portion just because I think the residents would be served better and you don't want that kind of mess in your basement. The lift station is to get rid of the sewer? The lift sewer. Uh, the sanitary sewer goes to a Met, Cal Met, Met Council runs the sewer treatment facility. The east side, the Spring Lake Park, the houses are lower. In the west side, <coughs> all the sanitary sewer goes from here <coughs> to a location by this behind the gas station. It gets pumped up in the air so the pipes are high enough at this end of the city to have gravity feed them down and keep them going to where my council does the water treatment. So if that don't work, this backs up. Okay. So it, it's very important that these these this stays, and I want people myself right here in the city and be able to take care of it so none of the residents have that kind of a problem. Good. Thanks, Bob. Um, Larry? Could you explain the $700,000 again? Each, each lift station repair or replacement would cost $700,000? That was that? the number that um, Terry, uh, the uh, city works administrator, had given to the council. Uh, I believe, I, I put the mayor on the spot, I believe we approved one in uh, last fall, and then we there is another one presented this spring summer. <clears throat> so it was uh, essentially there were two different styles of lift station. One was in ground, and it was easier to service, and the, and the staff could service. They could pull it out, and the other one was a, a different. It was half the price, but it was self-contained, and you had to get down in there. There's some mechanical reasons for it, and, and serviceable reasons for it. So. The staff, as it exists now, we're kind of elaborating on the question, um, is trained to service the existing style of stations. Which it, and the uh, new, the, the other style is half the price, but it would have to be serviced by somebody with equipment and a contractor and so on. So you're, you're talking two different things then. You're talking <coughs> maintaining the list stations or replacing? Replacing. replacing. Both replacing. replacing. And the cost that you got, did you get pricing from the contractor? I, I, I don't work for the city, so I just like the philosophical part of the question is: Should the city focus its resources on contracting services to private professionals, or should they keep? Should they focus on, or should they have things um, maintenance and so on kept in house? Well, I, I think it'd be great if we keep people working in house in regards to take care of your maintenance, which is an extremely part. But the only the only downside that I would have to that issue would be the uh, the warranty issues with the new lift station, if you were to put them in. I mean, if, if you had a contractor coming here, they probably would warrant this thing for over a period of time, where it would be at their cost if you ever, ever had to go back and do any replacement or repairs to them. Uh, In-house, you're taking money out of your pocket. Now, of course, the piece of equipment itself probably has is, is automatically got the warranty on it. But as far as the labor goes, most warranties don't cover, they may cover the warranty for the labor and material for one year, uh, or maybe the, the piece of equipment may be longer, but usually the labor is about one year. So I would probably go in the contractor side of it because I feel it's probably the uh, best bet because it's gonna be less uh, uh, cost to the city in the long run. 
Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> Jason? Is Terry Randall here? Mm -hmm. The reason I ask is uh, the question that you're asking is relating to two different fields in City Council. One is you're asking the council members or future council members to comment on an issue that the Public Works has done their research on. I don't have the information in front of me. Uh, I do remember this issue coming up last year as well as the spring. Um, personally, I would turn towards the people that we've actually hired to do this job. If, and I do know that there were independent contracts that were brought in to discuss the, uh, the pros and cons of the in-ground versus the above-ground and the contained system versus the self-supply. I like that we have people that live in the city, uh, as Bob had mentioned, uh, that are here to service the equipment. One of them is my neighbor. He lives right next door to me. Number two, the great thing about the system that we have in the city right now is I don't have a basement. So when the sewer backs up, it doesn't back up into my basement. So honestly, it's hard for me to, to have that discussion about whether or not I feel safe if the lift station fails. Um, I'm protected two ways. One, I can go over and wake up my neighbor and say, I smell something going on here. Um, <laughs> if he didn't get a call. Um, but I think that if we don't, if we try to rely too much on city council members, um, that aren't uh, versed in this information. Bob obviously is versed in, in the uh, sewer treatment center. I am not, but through his experience, he has learned. Um, at this time, I, I don't think I could give a reasonable answer to that question, um, not knowing the budget of it, and not knowing who could service it or the warranty issues with it. Um, so I, I could not answer that one. Good. Thanks, and uh, Tony? I kind of side with Jason on this one. Um, there's too many. I have too many questions around around the the uh, situation and, and circumstance. A lot of it around the contractor. Um, Three hundred fifty thousand sounds great, um, but what does that bring with it if it's all done by contractors? Um, what's the response time from the contractors? Are you know, uh, will they be there before everybody's basements start backing up? Um, uh, what, what's the cost of that additional service, or, or is that tied in with the, the purchase of the new lift? Um, so there's a lot of un, a lot of I still have a lot of questions around it, but based on what I've heard Bob say, speak to, um, I would feel very comfortable having our own city employees work on that um, because they're here, they're available. Um, it, it sounds like it's something that they already. Are, are familiar with and, and know how to, to repair if it, if it does break. Uh, so I, I guess there's two answers. One is I don't have enough information, but based on the information given, um, I would I would say definitely keep it internally. Okay. We'll just chalk it up to that question, but <laughs> 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 that's all right. <laughs> we have one of those tonight, and that's going to be that one. Um, we'll, we'll make this one a little bit easier, and we're going to go uh, Jason, Larry, Tony, and then Bob. I get the easy question. In the in the uh, packet of city ordinances, uh, there's about 550 pages of code and ordinances. And this is an easy. One. <laughs> 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 so, uh, our, our, what ordinance is there? A particular ordinance that that you feel strongly about adding, modifying, or removing? All of them. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I have been opposed to the way the ordinance was written. This, this actually is actually a fairly easy question for me. I am on planning and zoning. Uh, I have perused majority of the 550 pages, either at leisure because I sit at home and drink coffee and read through it. No. Um, having eight years of planning and zoning experience, I have learned that there are things that were adopted. They were borrowed, they were taken from other cities, they were sort of just cut and pasted into a book and saying, this is what we're going to do, because we had nothing. And for a while it worked, because we were sort of saying, well, Blaine's doing it, so let's do that. Or, you know what, Mounds, you just got this new system, and let's, let's try to adopt their system, and we like the way that works. They were able to keep out the riffraff kind of thing, so we want to emulate them. And then... Fridley. We want to emulate some of their ideas, but we've gotten to the point where we're so disjointed in the code that we never know for sure, one, if it's even up to date, uh, the parking regulations we have to keep looking at from other cities. So we ask Barry Brainer to go out and look and say, how does this parking regulation happen somewhere else? Um, perfect example, uh, the China Buffet <coughs> I moved in. 
great restaurant. Everyone loves it. Um, before it happened, uh, they do not have enough parking. They are about 200 over the amount of parking required. Um, or 200 less than what they're required. And it simply comes to the matter of they made a special exception to allow five per thousand as opposed to 15 for a restaurant. So we're, the zoning code and, and the ordinances are constantly in flux because things come up and they change. Um, the discussion earlier about the used card lots and the massage parlor or the exotic parlor and the strip club, the city is allowed to become more restrictive on their enforcement and the description of what they will or will not allow in the city uh, versus what the state will say. The state is very loose about what their reflections are because that's why you can still go to an adult bookstore, you can go to a strip club. So the city of Springfield Park is a lot more resilient in the fact that we've looked at all the cities around us and they constantly have been doing that. But what has happened is that we've got repeating code where you can find a loophole in one system of it by saying, well, my neighbor has this, commercially or residentially. <coughs> by doing so, you can do it. Which it, in, in <laughs> it has changed the actual height of the accessory buildings and detached garages in Stranley Park from 15 to 18 feet, for good or for bad. Uh, for some people, it's very good. who are putting up new garages. Um, they get to go to an 18 foot height, as long as it's not taller than the house itself. Well, the additions to your house, if it goes taller than 24 feet, you can then attach a garage to the house that is at exactly the same height, so then you're no longer limited. So I think we need to relook at a lot of the ordinances that we've already written. Okay, thanks. Uh, Larry? Well, first of all, how many ordinances are there? Oh, it's hundreds and hundreds. Five hundreds. Hundreds and thousands. Well, it might. I, and you're asking me which ones I want to rid of. No, I'm saying if you have a specific one, well, if one that you want to add. Well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I haven't had a chance to go through all 500 of them. And I don't think I want to go through all 500 of them. And, uh, but what I will add to this is the fact that, if in fact, uh, uh, they're all dated, or they needed to be updated, I should say then I think there should be a periodic review of all ordinances in the city. Um, and then uh, uh, as, a, as a city council person, I think it's the uh, responsibility to make sure that those are uh, either taken off the books or left that way. So, but to really elaborate on which ones I would, you know, that's, that's a shot in the dark. I don't think I'd really want to respond to that. All right, thanks. I'm really not looking for like everyone. Just like <laughs> if you had something that this is my pet project that I really think should go or should stay, that kind of thing. Uh, Tony, um, yeah. answer that. Um, kind of like uh, Larry and Jason, I, have, I haven't had a chance to really read through um, all, all of the ordinances. However, uh, from discussions from my neighbors who've been here uh, 30, 40, uh, 50 years, um, I, I think their biggest frustration is the building ordinances because they've either modified or changed, or there's so many of them that they don't know which one to follow, and, and as Jason was saying, that in some of them there's loopholes. Um, just to, to add to what Larry was saying, and I kind of agree with him, that really we need a periodic review of all the ordinances. And I would ask each um, each department head to, to take time, review those ordinances, and let's try and get them consistent. Um, and especially get rid of the ones that are no longer needed. Um, I, I'm sure there's probably some that are still on, on, still listed from when the city was incorporated that probably aren't really relevant to this day. Um, those could be those could be removed uh, if they're no longer relevant, and really clean them up and, and make them easy for uh, residents to understand, and, and even <laughs> and even city staff to to really understand and comprehend. All right, thanks, uh, Bob. A lot of the codes do overlap um, in the 10 years that I've been here. Uh, council has ta talked about the recodification, having, having the zoning book go through a process of exactly what you're talking about. The amount of money is huge. I think what the, the staff and what council has done in the past as different issues come up and this kind of adds to the problem of overlapping things, but we, we instead of having this huge balloon payment, trying to rewrite this in, in hundreds and hundreds of hours of staff time, because it's not just the building inspector, there's police in there, there's public works in there, but everything you can imagine. Um, 
to go through it all would be a huge, huge uh, money investment for the city. What we've tried to do as issues come up and as the world's changing, building processes change. First it was slab homes, then it was L-shaped ramblers, then it was split levels, then it was split entries, then it was this, that. As designing and everything has changed, we've tried to adapt it to that and go from there to avoid the balloon payment. Certain things do cause a lot of frustration for a lot of residents in a lot of cities and you don't know where to go and there's three, four different answers to everything. In a perfect world, it would be nice to do it all, but uh, I think it would be a huge, huge amount of money. And if we can get on track, get it eliminated, the ones that are obsolete, as we go through, instead of leaving them there, take it one little step farther. So what you just added, you make sure the other one was deleted. In time, it will correct itself, and it will not be a huge expenditure of the residents' funds. Good, thank you. Um, we have just a couple more questions. If people have uh, questions, can, can you come pick this up? Uh, if people have questions, um, you know, I'm happy to uh, happy to entertain them here. So our our next question is going to go to. Um, let me just ask uh, Jason. So this is going to go Larry, Bob, Tony, <coughs> and, and then Jason. And. <clears throat> The police department budget, budget comprises over 40% of the $3.5 million general budget in 2012. Actual spending for the police department um, was $1.3 million in 2007, $1.41 million in 2009, and $1.45 million in 2010. Uh, we don't have the actual numbers yet for 2012. The projected <laughs> was uh, $1.47 million. The city has also recently approved 3% increases to police officer salaries this year. Uh, with the continued increase in police protection costs, what would you propose as a solution to address the ongoing increase in the spirit of the public service? Well, first of all, I, I think you're dealing with unions here, if I'm not mistaken, aren't they? There's, uh, sure. there's two separate. Yeah, okay. so when you're negotiating with, the city is negotiating with the police department or, or, the, or the union that they belong to, you're, you're dealing with uh, collective bargaining agreements. Um, and I believe the answer would be to get collective bargaining agreement people who are who are uh, knowledgeable in those particular areas and negotiating contracts. Um, uh, as far as their budget for the year, um, at one point five million dollars this year is uh, comprised, like I said earlier, about forty four percent of Spring Lake Park City budget of three point four million. Um, you gotta remember, our police are twenty four hour a day, three hundred sixty five days a year. Um, I feel safe in our community. I think as far as what they what they get, <coughs> I, I, apparently I wouldn't want the job. I think they've earned it. Um, um, but I think to answer your question, what would I do? I would probably get professional people in the collective bargaining agreement with the union to address the cost up. Thank you. Uh, Bob? <coughs> You're right. Uh, they were all, they are all unionized. I've been on both sergeants and patrol officers. Uh, union negotiations throughout the years in the city. Uh, you are held there. We've had great success in the past working with our police department, telling them how strapped we were, this and that. I mean, they negotiated down from us a real lot. But the last thing you want to take is get it to go into uh, a denial deal because historically speaking, uh, we've never won one. So the best thing to do in the city councils in the past, and I think uh, you're, you're dealing with unions and the contracts, is, is to work with your employees. And I found them to be very uh, negotiable with us. Um, they accepted a few other things, some extra money for uniforms instead of wages, uh, some eyeglass protection because the cops keep getting punched at the high school by the students and breaking their glasses. The, the safety, we have one of the safest police departments, the best police departments in the city, I believe, around. As far as going out in any place else, when this question came up over the years of having another police department come into the city or take it over, you got to have something when you go there, you got to have something to negotiate with that city. What do I have to offer? He's got to go back to his constituents. Uh, the surrounding cities, there was none that wanted to jump on the plate. 
Mounds View was the only one that was interested because too much infrastructure problems <coughs> between the two different counties, especially in the juvenile system, and where they would overlap and how the control officers could even uh, present their cases in a court of law. So that basically would be another huge balloon payment. You don't want to do it. County portions to look at it, having the sheriff's department come here. For about the first three years, you might be cheaper, but as their pay steps go up, and you're dealing with another uh, um, police department, you'd end up at the same or more because you need so many officers 24 hours a day to protect the streets. The best bang for your buck is the way we're doing it right now. It's a good community. The seniors and everybody like knowing their officers, know their names. How are you, John? How are you, Joe? How are you, Sally? I don't want to use their real names, but um, uh, I find a, a lot of security that our residents have knowing their own police department. Okay, thanks. Um, and then I believe uh, Tony? Yes, um, because it is union, um, we're, our hands are a little bit strapped. Uh, we're going to end up having to negotiate with them. Um, I like the idea of bringing in a professional negotiator. However, um, I, I believe that our, our police department is, uh, from what uh, Bob has shared, willing to work with the city. That's that's always a good thing. And I and just from uh, on the residents' side, um, we have a very good police department, and I would hate to see us do anything to damage or. or uh, create any kind of tension in that relationship. Uh, coming from, I used to live in Minneapolis, coming from that side uh, and being a resident and working with the police department there, it's completely night and day. Um, I enjoy the police officers here. Um, they, when they when they talk to me, it, it's usually on a first name basis. Um, I have no issues with them. Uh, and they, they work hard. They, they work very hard, uh, especially for our community. So when it comes to the, the negotiations, um, if they're understanding how strapped the city is and they're willing to, to be flexible and, and work with us, I, I think we should um, try and work with them also. Okay, thanks. And uh, Jason? I disagree with all three of you. I, I believe that you're all under the concept that we're being extorted by the police department. The police union is not here to extort money from the city. Uh, negotiating with the police officers is not a matter of blackmail. Uh, we've asked them to be here. The, one of the first things of being incorporated in the city was to ask for a police department, to, to hire people to stand up there and take a bullet for us. Um, as far as negotiating, I wouldn't mind sitting around and listening to how much they're getting paid just as a curiosity, because I need to know what their life is worth. I, I don't think that we're looking at this question correctly. Uh, it's 40% of our budget. What was it 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 1953? What was it then? Was it 100%? We needed one cop to patrol the area. I'm not ready to stick my finger into that fire. Um, I don't believe that the police department or the fire department has done anything to extort money or to raise money except to get the, the latest equipment uh, to keep investigators here to investigate crimes. Uh, I've had crimes committed on my property. Uh, I don't need to go into it, but it's a matter of when I picked up the phone, they showed up. When my neighbors picked up the phone, they showed up. Uh, I, I, I don't believe that 40% uh, of our budget is wasted. Um, are there ways to cut money in the, the police department? I don't know. I'd have to ask the chief. Um, it's his responsibility. He's the one that was hired to do the job, to become the par department head, um, to run his business. Uh, again, this gets sounded with the public works. We hire these people to do this job for us. City council members are not here to, to arbitrate union negotiation or to risk the lives of the residents. Um, so I believe that, uh, you know, without, by trusting the people that we've hired to do their job, that I would have faith in that person who's running their job to know what their budget is. If they can find ways to save money, they're going to try. Does it mean taking a patrolman off the, off the street because they can get extra help from Fridley or, or Blaine or Mouseview? Well, then I would leave that 
in the hands of the chief. The chief has actually started looking into that, into a shared resources system with other cities. It has been brought up at city council. The city council is looking towards that and trying to do it. Um, so I don't think that uh, we're the right people to make that decision. That is the staff that we've hired to do the job. Thank you. Uh, the next question will go <coughs> Tony, Jason, uh, and, and uh, Larry. We've just got a couple more uh, left here. Uh, this is kind of a, a more lax. Uh, let's get into the same thing. Let's see here. Uh, currently, 19% uh, of the property within the city limits of Spring Lake Park is non taxable. Uh, this includes parks, churches, schools, and one railroad parcel. Currently, Spring Lake Park is in the top 20 cities out of 127 cities in, in the metro area for the highest residential property tax rates. Uh, with city services and staff costs increasing annually, the city has attempted to address this issue by cutting spending in the last uh, year by 1.9%. How will you address this issue, ongoing issue, if you're elected? Which issue? Uh, the, <laughs> the issue of uh, are we going to raise revenue <coughs> spending? Is there anywhere in particular? <coughs> I, I tell you, from as a city, we run pretty, we run pretty lean, from what I can tell. Uh, from the uh, budgets that I've been able to see, from what's available online, uh, we run pretty lean as a city. Uh, we control the budgets pretty tight. Uh, is there always room for for cutting more? Uh, I would say, absolutely, but the question is where. Um, with 19% uh, of the property being untaxable, um, I, I've heard there's ways you can uh, get revenue from those some of those properties. I don't know if I agree with that avenue of, of getting revenue from those properties, especially churches and, and other uh, maybe not-for-profit organizations. Um, I, I believe bringing in more business, uh, again, as I stated earlier, addressing the housing issue, uh, within Spring Lake Park, getting those vacancies filled, um, attracting more businesses to come to Spring Lake Park and invest is is one of the directions we could go to to address that gap that we're we're seeing. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Jason. Uh, of the nineteen percent, do you have a breakdown of what is religious and what is uh, <coughs> district no. district owned by its schools? I, I don't. I, I it's pretty close to about 16% of the 19%. I don't think that the park system actually equates to more than 3 or 4% of the entire 19% you're talking about. Um, another huge chunk is probably 12% of the high school and the elementary schools. Sure, we can squeeze them for money. Uh, oh wait, we can't. Uh, we're not allowed to tax the school district. We're also not allowed to tax the, the nonprofits that are running also. Um, so garnering money from people in that 19% is pretty tough because we'd have to garner from ourselves because you're including the parks, the religious churches of whichever faith, and the two or three school district buildings that are actually still in, the, in Spring Lake Park. Um, we do have some vacant land uh, that is out there. Is there a way to make money on the vacant land? Yes, they proposed it, uh, I think it was seven years ago, uh, when the first idea to purchase the corner property in San Bernal. Uh, was the uh, sale of the properties on McKinley Street. It hasn't sold. Uh, it's proven that it's a lot more difficult to sell the lots down there in this economy, and it was at the time seven years ago. It just wasn't the right location to put housing. Um, trying to make up for the 19% loss is probably, you know, do we want to argue with is 19% enough? Uh, do we have enough school? Do we have enough park system? Do we have enough churches in our area? I don't know. I, I'm not that person to make that decision. I mean, as a council member, we can vote on issues that relate to it, but I don't believe that the 19% is a swaying idea. Uh, oh, well, we're going to tip over to 19.5% if we vote on this having this extra church in here. So we're going to say no to a church or a charter school in order to keep that 81%. That and I don't think that that's what kind of city we are. Yes, are we talking about increasing taxes or decreasing taxes? Uh, having charter schools and churches and the school district paying for city services, which they do, helps reimburse the city for those so the special services we offer, police and fire protection, city water and sewer systems, 
So they do still pay for those services, even though they're part of the 19% tax removal burden. That's, that's it. Okay. Thanks. I just want to clarify this question. <coughs> what can we do about the 19%? <laughs> no, it, it wasn't an intended in that direction. It was just that whenever anybody talks about lack of revenue or lack of spending, every time it's, well, we have 19% yep. on taxable, um, is the response from the city a lot of times. So, but I'll reiterate, it, it's not about the 19%. That's an untaxable amount. They're still paying city services. Yep. So they're still, still paying for the police department. They're still paying for the fire department. They're still paying for their sewer and water. Those are still bills that they're still paying. They're not getting a free ride in the city completely, and all the taxpayers have to pay for it. <laughs> well, it's 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 kind of a it's a hard question. It, I, I guess about the most honest, straight thing is it is what it is. Um, we're 99, 98 percent developed. Uh, we have what we have now. Uh, is there going to be a huge influx of more of it? No. There's no place for them to go. So uh, the community, the schools, and the parks, they're here. Our community needs them. Our, our community's proud of our schools. Our community's proud of our parks. We want to take them apart and bulldoze it to level it off and put in houses. Heaven snow. Uh, uh, I look at it from being on Jordan Law for 10 years. Uh, I don't know of 100 ride lines with the police officers. Um, I'm very pro park. If I can get my parks department to wear them kids out hard enough during the day that they ain't breaking into our houses or doing something <laughs> bad at night, this is what we got to do. If anything, some of our park and recreation stuff has to be improved to keep our youth busy, give them a direction to go, and hopefully they don't end up in the judicial system and in the back of our squad cars, it's going to cost everybody money on the county level. And then we can keep that down by being more involved with our youth and keeping them busy and in good schools. Next one, and uh, Larry? 19% non taxable, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the question you're looking for then is, is where can we find more revenue or how can we cut the budget? Could be essentially, yeah. yeah. That would be part of the equation you're talking about. Um, uh, right now, you know, uh, looking at the uh, uh, budget that was proposed, the, the, uh, 3.4 million. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, is, is that less than last year, isn't it? Was was Cindy? This is for a friend now. <laughs> 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 One point, maybe you have to continue to review the uh, uh, the city budget every year. You know, maybe you know, according to the auditors around here, apparently what they do, they just look at uh, expenditures at the end of the year and then they compare everything as to how the budget really equated. Um, uh, maybe there's a there's a point during the course of the year where you have to start looking at that budget and those expenditures, and if you're saving those things. You know, from from quarter to quarter, maybe that's, those those are the revenue savings that you're actually looking for. So the following year, the, 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 the 2014 budget should probably be lower. So. Or else you can create more business around here. We're going to do with new business in the area. But like I said, that's what you said, 99 percent flood filled around here. Now, so I don't think we're going to get any more business. So I don't know. You, I, I, that's a tough question. I think you have to continually evaluate the budget. That's all. Very All right, and uh, just to let you guys know, we've got two questions left, and we've got a question from the audience. So, uh, if anybody has any other questions, you know, feel free to, to bring them up. This is a follow-up question that a member of the audience submitted. Um, they said that uh, basically on the subject of the severance and the department heads agreement that was discussed earlier, um, what do you feel is an appropriate uh, amount of severance to be provided to the department heads? Uh, they're asking specifically, is one or two months package, is that more appropriate than six months? But um, we'll just go through with uh, Bob answering first, and then Larry and Jason. <coughs> appropriate. Well, it's, you know, it's always sad to lay anybody off and you're talking about tax dollars, and usually when you're laying somebody off, it's because of budget cuts. You lost your LGA, I remember when we lost $248,000 and when we went whack, and we already had the budget done. 
uh, when we loved, when we lost our market value homestead credits, and the check was supposed to be on the 31st of, Jan of, of December, and it didn't show up, and we'd already spent the money and had to had to. It, it was a it was a real mess. Uh, what year? What year? What year was that? You're, you keep saying we, and you're referring to a specific a council. Okay. A council. And, and not you on council, or you on? Yeah, I was on. I was on council. Well, both. Right. I, I, I just want. I just clarify. You keep saying we. Well, like, I mean, you're when, when you're on the council, it's a group, and you work together. It's 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 it's, it's not uh, supposed to be a one-sided, lobby dictatorship. Yep. It, 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 it it's a group of people that hopefully. Um, um, Understand the different needs of all the different people, different backgrounds, wherever you're coming from, and you, you throw all these ideas in this hat and you shake them all together and you try to pick one up that fits the best for the community and the best for everything to make sure the impact or the benefits to the residents are the best. Thanks, uh, Bob and uh, Larry. Uh, the sentence you're talking about now is it for an individual who gets fired? Is it an individual who gets laid off? Well, it's a little fired without, essentially, from what I read in the department contract, is it's fired without misconduct or terminated without misconduct. Terminated, okay, all right. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, but I have to take a hard stance on this. I, you know, in the, in the private sector out there, you know, I, you know and, and a, lot of, a lot of companies out there, they probably, in good faith, probably, if you've been a good employee, they probably, uh, 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 they lay that individual off at the beginning of the month, they probably pay them through the end of the month. You know, that would probably be the end of it. But as far as putting a package together to say how much should we provide to people on the road, I still think it should be. <coughs> okay. Thanks, uh, Jason. Uh, I'm going to stick with the stand I have. I think that uh, <coughs> trying to entice uh, people who want to stay with the city, um, six months is not a huge amount of time uh, in order to allow for severance. It's, it's a more attractive than the private sector. Uh, but you're not going to get pay increases like you would in the private sector. So in order to, to help even the balance, so if somebody's going to quit and they're going to leave on their own and move to another job, we're not paying the severance package. If we fire them because the job does not exist anymore, then we've displaced the worker. And most larger companies, which hopefully the city feels that we are trying to run a business here, you are trying to run a city like a business. And in doing so, you have to offer something to entice somebody to come to you instead of going to work in the private sector. Can I get an administrative assistant to work for the city for $12 an hour that they're never going to get a pay increase because they're controlled by the city council's vote yes or no for the next 4, 12, 50 years, however long they're going to plan, 31 years in the case of our administrator. Trying to keep an administrator as long as we've had 31 years is fairly, uh, it's pretty hard to do. You can't get one that'll stay that long. But in the enticement packages, that's what they're offering. They're going to renegotiate. But I think that at the beginning, when you're trying to lure people into the city to keep them here to work for us, a six month severance package on a $12 an hour job is not a huge amount of money. Pardon? $12? I, I just used a number. I'm sorry, but I mean, if you're hiring, <laughs> Right, we'll I just picked the number, actually. We'll let, uh, if I said $50 an hour, people would have been upset. But I mean, a $12 an hour job to come and run the city is, you know, it's not a lot. And a six month package is an equitable amount. All right, now, uh, All right Tony and your, and your response. Yeah, I mean, I think my response, I, my preference, uh, and this comes from just working in corp with corporations and in corporations for uh, almost 17 years and even still today. My, my preference would be uh, is something where it's it's uh, so many years you earn so much time. If you've, if you've been in your position or you've been working for the city for five years, you earn a month or, or two months. Ten years, you earn an additional two months. Mm -hmm. Something so that it's accumulative. Because uh, that would be a good incentive for them to stay. Because it's, it would be, I, and this is just my opinion. It would be easier for someone who is 25, 30 years old, who may be displaced, to go and seek employment elsewhere for, than for someone who's been with the city for 30 years and all of a sudden is displaced. 
it's much more difficult for them to find uh, employment either at another city or, or sometimes another business um, that's either going to pay the same, um, that's going to uh, make up the difference in uh, as far as skill set. So having the uh, having a program or, or something in place where each year earns you so much amount, a certain amount of severance would be uh, my preference. And, and it also avoids um, getting a, a new employee in, they work three years, they're displaced, and all of a sudden you have to give them six months severance. You know, they, they would have to earn that and, and try to at least uh, maybe move to another position in the city if one's available. Thanks. Um, so the next, uh, next to last question on that, on that seven, yeah. sure. Just, just some closing. You know? Everybody's okay with that. I suppose. When they were hired with a with a benefit package of the manager, it was a full time employee. So I'm going to probably take the worst case scenario of an individual who probably works here as a full time as a professional and probably makes fifty thousand dollars a year working for the city. Uh, you're looking at a six month seven package. You're going to allow somebody to walk away with $25,000. Now, what that package that we provided people when you were hired was probably a, a retirement package. You probably have 401k or whatever you have here within the city. You also probably give them vacation time. Now, the vacation time probably is accumulated over the course of time. Now, I don't know if they retire or if they quit or if they get that particular money they, as well. It's a lump sum cash out. Mm -hmm. but they're it's a, at the end, when they retire, they get paid out. Yeah. Whatever are, are we are we discussing the actual contract that we don't have and none of us have seen? I, I just want to clarify that you're asking for an opinion on a contract none of us have been privy to that was shown to somebody. No, the to contract vote on. is available in in the city council packet and it okay. has been available twice this year, I believe. Presented okay, to the city I, I haven't seen it. So I didn't know that there was a specific uh, skill set that was required for. September seventeenth meeting was, oh, uh, September 17th. was the packet I believe that has the the waste department has the proposal. So then just some closing. All, I'm saying, all I want to say is the fact that it's you know, you know these people probably are deserving of uh, some sort of a package of that particular nature. But if you're gonna be if you're gonna get hired, it's gonna have to be an upfront thing with any contract of course to include it. But I think overall I think in the long run it would end up being a uh, uh, a cost impact to the city of Springline Park. And that just goes back to the last question you were talking about. How can we save money within the city? That's probably one of the areas where you don't want to start putting it in there because now you're starting to add it to the budget. Okay. So. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. Uh, if I could yep. make a little bit of, little bit of so clarification. The 401k is called para when you're in, a, when yeah. you're in the city government. Uh, the city has allowed uh, sick days to be banked. Uh, uh, all different types of uh, vacations. Uh, it, they can walk away with a lot of money when they bank it. There's been some, and I, think, and I, I don't believe it's uh, the financial legal for me to say so, but uh, it is a huge chunk of money. But they have earned it, and they have saved it. And yes. so they didn't, if they leave, they, you, if they did it right, they're not walking on broke. All right. Um, so our, our uh, next to last question, last complicated numbers question, and then after this, our final one will be a little bit easier. Here. Um, <clears throat> this is what everybody's been dancing around. The, the city liquor store currently runs at less than three percent profit on gross sales of two point three million dollars annually over the, each of the last five years. In two thousand ten, the last year of reported finances to the state government, the city liquor store operated with twenty seven thousand dollars in net profit. Uh, the City Liquor Store Reserve Fund earlier this year had a balance of $750,000. This is their capital reserve fund that they can draw from. <coughs> the city transfers $150,000 from this reserve fund into the general city fund for the purpose of reducing residential property taxes every year. Uh, at the current rate of withdrawal, the reserve fund will be empty in approximately seven years, and the city will be barely breaking even with no reserve fund to speak of. As of as the, the end of August 2012, the liquor store claimed $80,000 in net profit, and in the current discussions over repairs required and mold remediation required for the liquor store, the estimates are over $80,000. So how will you address this uh, quote-unquote financial time bomb prior to the depletion of the fund? And uh, this question is going to go to um, 
Jason first, then Larry, then Tony, then. Thanks. <laughs> I actually, uh, coincidentally, we just I, we just asked we're asked this question uh, through the Blaine Sprout Park Life. Um, they asked fairly close to the same question as what during this last council uh, workshop that they were discussing of uh, the taking the three jobs and combining them into two jobs and then asking the people who they were just terminating to reapply for the same job. Uh, with the amount of mold remediation, the, the you didn't mention the loading dock situation, which actually is actually going to cost more. Yeah. Uh, there, it's actually rebuilding. It's a rebuild. Um, you're talking $100,000 or more. Uh, and again, it comes down to who are the best bids for it. So you've got 100000 taken off the $700,000 reserve that you were discussing. So now we've taken another year off. So now we have six years left uh, of that capital gains money. Um, but I wanted to just clarify the percentage. You're talking 27%. $27,000. 27000 not 27%. Not 27 $27,000. million dollars was the net profit of the liquor store in 2010. So out of that, so literally less than 1%. Yeah, it was 0 0.3 or 0.5. And so that is the money we're making at the liquor store currently. And we're eating out of a fund that we created how long ago? Um, 20 years ago, more than 20. I think this okay. year they're looking at... Based if on we have somebody in the audience who has the information, please <laughs> go ahead and spill it. <laughs> you want know, it's 20. Um, it's, well, it's Dr. Dr. Money, he's talking, just <coughs> one clarification on the money he's talking about in the reserve. Yeah. That money came from when the city got out of the municipal bar business we sold our That's two where I was leading with the question yeah. to, to and, Ryan was to ask was about the two liquor stores that were run by Monty's, the city. Monty's, well, that was open bar situation. Was a, was a bar on one run. side where Keith was was a, a, a off sale. Where? And Polinsky's was the same. here long enough. And I don't where. Know. <laughs> so that's where these funds are coming from. Right, right. So the reserve fund was 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 made basically by selling the licenses to allow these private companies to take over what were municipal bars. So we're, we're talking 20 years ago. Yeah. So 20, some 20 years ago, we created a fund through the sale, and we've been eating out this fund the entire time to fund the liquor store. Is where I was going with it. Not to, to reduce city taxes. No, 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 yeah. to, to reduce city taxes, we've been eating out of the general fund that should have been fed by the liquor store itself, which was the proposed and promised agreement. The agreement was to be 15 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent. Depending on the projections and the person who stood in front of the podium discussing how much we were going to make in creating our own liquor store, a central park liquor store on 65, it cannot lose. I was not there for that meeting. I was too young. I was uh, probably in elementary school at the time. Um, but I did frequent both locations with family. It was a family location that we went to, and they were productive. Uh, when the city sold those two productive locations, they created one location that has become sort of a money pit. It is absorbing money every year, and it is not making money at all. So how would you uh, look to resolve that issue? Shut the liquor store down. There are too many issues at this time with the mold, the loading dock situation, to the health and welfare of the people who are working there. If we can get an estimate as to how long the liquor store could be shut down in order to refurbish it and get a cost, and then evaluate that cost with what's left over in our budget, general fund or not, it was originally established for the liquor store itself. If the monies to refurbish this building outweigh the money we have left in that fund, it's time to close it and think of a different option, either leasing the building up to somebody else to run it, and we gain a 10 or 15 percent margin. Whether it comes out to $27,000 a year, we don't have the liability on the liquor store. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> well, yeah, actually, it's been 27 years from what it, uh, some of the figures I got. The building was 27 years old. Um, um, the city decided to get into the liquor store business, but it neglected the operation of it. That's my personal opinion. I think in the long run, I think it, uh, I'm not going to tell you whether to close it or not. I'm, I'm just going to give you my opinions in regards to it. Um, oh, we're asking. Uh, I, I think I think if, if it's open right now, so I think as long as it's going to continue to stay open, I don't think we're going to go down there and I can shut it. Uh, um, I think you need to continue to review that business as a business. 
post it and review the revenue streams on a quarterly basis. I think the city has, has ignored the operation of that thing, other than the fact that once a year we finally get a financial report that shows that we made $26,000 income before transfers. They do this $150,000 intergovernment transfer, which is taken from Peter to give the ball, but it's coming all out of the same pocket. Um, my feeling on this thing is that if, if you're going to stay in the business, run the business like a business should be run. I think you, 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 you got to look at the financial reports. They should be reviewed on a quarterly basis. I think it's like any other business that's going to be running out there. You have to be on top of what's going on. If you're going to wait at the end of the year to review a business and look at the bottom line and say it's not making any business, there's a lot of things that probably went into the fact why they lost money this particular year, but I haven't really come up and found somebody to tell me what the problems were. Why they lost money? I think it could be. Maybe it's a management issue. Who knows? Is it a, a city? Is it a city issue? Who knows? But I still think that in regards to the repairs that need to be done over there, they got a mold problem, they got a wall problem, they got a rooftop unit issue up there, they've got a loading dock issue up there. Of course, <coughs> that money is going to have to come from somewhere in order to pay for it. Um, um, my feeling on that thing is, is if the city is going to be in the business of being a liquor store business, then run the business like a liquor store business should be run. Don't wait till the end of the year to find out that you get a financial statement and you're only made twenty-six thousand dollars. That's that's asinine. That is really stupid. I think anybody who's ever been in business and has looked at financial reports and finally just waited till the end of the year to find out that they didn't make any money, they're not running it properly. So my feeling is that at this particular moment, I think it should be open to discussion, and I think the city council should continue to review this thing on a quarterly basis. Thank you, Larry. Um, Tony? I'd have to say ditto. <laughs> I agree. Um, I, 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 am, I, I am pleased that the council did take action and, and work with the employees. Uh, the last thing you want to do is um, lay someone off, um, and hopefully that didn't happen. Um, however, um, hearing all the issues that there are with the liquor store, I, I agree with Jason and Larry that um, there sounds like there's a lot of mismanagement that had taken place and, and actually um, one of the things maybe uh, if, if the city doesn't want to continue in the liquor store business is to then do what we did with the Monty's and uh, was it Plavinsky's is turn it over to private operation and, and just get out of the business completely. Um, it, it sounds like uh, and I was around at the time when the whole liquor store was built and and these promises were made um, that the Highway 65 would be the location, but it sounds like um, promises were made, there were some missteps along the way, and uh, not much action to to step in and, and make corrections. And I think that's where that's why we are where we are today. Um, so my stance is if if we're not gonna if we're not gonna run a liquor store as a business, look at Look at the look at the income. Look at what we're making. Are we profitable? And I would say not even quarterly. I'd almost go monthly. What are we bringing in? What's our what are we are we making a profit? Are we even breaking even? If we're not, then things need to be put in motion. Start looking at other ways of restructuring. If that's not going to work, and if if we do restructure and it doesn't work, then you know, the ultimate decision has to be to either close it down, uh, which I, I think closing it would be my last option because then you're impacting employees. But another option is to sell it off to private and hopefully they retain those employees. Thank you. I, I have to jump in. I, I, we're all day, you, the three of them are dancing around the elf in the room. The issue has we less at this point. Answer and then, oh, all right. then we'll take the puddles. Okay. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Um, well, I've been trained. I thought here for okay. a second. Um, restructuring that was just happened and reposition of the managers and uh, wages there uh, was way overdue. Um, I tried and I tried throughout 10 years to get restructuring done there. The writing is in our wall, on the wall. You do have a liquor commission. And, and you do review the profits less than once a year. Um, 
I think it's bi monthly, if I remember right. Every two months we have it. Um, the money wasn't there. A lot of the problems came way back when, and that, that manager is no longer with us. He decided to drop all the maintenance issues, maintenance, service maintenance agreements on the building. And for whatever reason, the past mayor, a while back, allowed this to happen, and he served on the Liquor Commission. Did not put a stop to it. Uh, the salaries of the three big employees uh, was way too top heavy. I mean, that, 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 that came to about $210,000 a year for three managers, which is extremely out of line. That got bring into with some of the restructuring, and they went around to the city to find out whatever managers and municipal liquor stores throughout the state and everything were doing and bring it back down. Um, and sometimes the old uh, do not touch the sacred cash cow has went on in the past in the city. Um, the writing was there. Uh, when I made mayor and got on the liquor commission, myself there, we started doing some of the maintenance issues, addressing them, the new furnaces and everything that were falling apart and trying to repair this to keep the liquor store viable to get profit margins back up to keep it there. Uh, management is the key. Um, you got to run it like a business. You can't run it like you do with calling the streets and other services that the city provides. It is a business. Um, I'm hoping that in time with this restructuring that's happening, you got to give it time. You got to let everything go into play. And these profits can come back out. You can make it work, and you can do it. To bulldoze it down, to lease it out, you would be leasing out a problem. If there is all these more problems, this, if you're leasing it, you're responsible. You can put the buck back out of the city, so I don't think that's an option. But uh, I would like to keep it open, open myself, some, possibly some more restructuring of personnel and the maintenance agreements on the building in a timeline that we make it for you and profitable. Okay. Um, and now you guys, I'd like to make sure that we're out of here by 9 o'clock. So if we could, if you guys want to do a comment, if we can keep it under a minute and then. I, I, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the issue that we're trying to address, address this point. Is that the confusion that happened in the papers and the things that the, the agenda item that came up was a discussion about the salaries for the three into two. And then, oh, gee, we need to look at the loading dock situation. And everyone sort of turned a blind eye to the mold issue in the actual liquor store. And if anyone is curious as to what it looks like, the liquor store is still open. Run down there, walk in, look up. If you cannot see the black mold growing on the air ducts inside this store, and you're concerned about a $27,000 gain per year and oh let's review this in six months or three months or a year and we want to push this off and review it again we need to take action immediately this is not this is a health issue over 10 square feet becomes an, uh, a, a minor health hazard over a hundred square feet becomes a major health hazard it can shut the building down I, I've done my math it's larger than a 10 by 10 square area inside this liquor store it needs to be addressed uh, three contractors have come in to give a remediation agreement for it. They're not even being looked at. Why is this not the, the major item on the agenda right now? Why is council not discussing? Why is council not moving on this issue? They're discussing salaries of the three highest people. That is not the main concern at this point. The loading dock is not the main issue. It has to do with the mold inside the liquor store. And that's why I feel it needs to be shut down. It is a health hazard to the people working there, along with the people who are frequenting it. You're an occasional walk, you walk in occasionally, you touch it, you grab your beer, you walk outside, and now you've got the mold, you're carrying it with you. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Let's try to keep this and then we have one There was just a meeting on this particular issue with the city of Fenway Park. They did have an evaluation of the mold. The mold issue came back and they said that it's not harmful to the public. However, in the future, it doesn't have to be evaded. evaded. Um, um, the cost impacts are due to the maintenance that the city of Spring Lake Park has been lacking over the course of time. 
And it, you know, all you have to do is look in the mirror as to how this problem was created. You know, so and I think the city is playing like part right now with the meeting I was at. They do have proposals in order to to bait the mold, to put the rooftop unit in, they to take the wall down. And they, with the testing that has come back from these from this uh, testing laboratories, have said that that mold is not harmful to the public. And I think that's got to be made clear because. But they said that the percentage per million is not a high enough to equate a general health hazard, which means that the people who've been working in this for years, it has so become an issue. Well, you said the people that were walking out of there, you're going to have mold on your clothes, and you're going to end up... I won't there. walk into the liquor store at this time. I, I seriously okay. refuse well, this to. Is a this is only debate, so... Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a cost in the city. It's just because of the lack of the building. So you're only working here. Bob or uh, Tony, do you want to follow up or? I have a question. Yeah. No. Okay. All right. Um, we got one question from the audience, uh, and then we got a final question. Um, what is your position on giving zoning variances to individuals? Um, something that would make their property perhaps unique. Um, and an example is the uh, the horseshoe driveway issue. Is that a question to me? Uh, I should say who it's to, shouldn't I? Uh, this question is to uh, Larry. Oh, I tell you, I don't know anything about it, so I really can't comment. But as far as the zoning uh, variances to this particular issue, I think we've got. Um, Bob, and then Tony, and then Jason. <laughs> okay. Um, a lot of the horseshoe driveways came about before the city even had an ordinance pertaining to driveways. People were allowed to pretty much have any type of driveway on their property that fit their property, whether it was horseshoe, there was an incident on Terrace Road where it went in behind some trees and it was there before you ever needed a, a, a zoning permit, permit to put in the road. It was there for years when the street project went through and we added the curbs and the gutters to the city. They tried to regulate this. And the people that had to, if it didn't fit, fit into that vision, they chopped it off and they took it away. And they left off, chopped off driveways in the middle of front yards. It looked like hell. Um, if it wasn't broke, why did you try to fix it? Um, as long as the person uses their property to make it look the best and what suited them and their family is what should have always been preserved. Just because you change something there, now you go in there and you basically destroy what their yard was developed around. Well, there's a rock garden in the middle, trees in the middle, this type of things. So those people should have been grandfathered in. They were not allowed to. Some people that were handicapped, that had driveways, what they called a nowhere driveway that went up to the edge of their house, and they were handicapped. And handicapped stickers marked with canes had that driveway taken away and it had to come from the back side of the garage and corner lots which was very bad because sometimes the garage is off to the side instead of up to the front they couldn't even get to their house they wouldn't even carry in stack there needs to be flexibility for the people consideration of what the property is what their physical condition is and and it just it just should have never been played with it should have just been left alone and i fought and fought and fought and we finally got some resolution on it Thanks. Uh, Tony? Uh, yes, I know the property that Bob is referring to. I um, actually talked to the, the family that lives there now. And um, actually my neighbor was impacted by the curbs and gutters. Uh, same thing, had a variance. Uh, it wasn't a horseshoe, but had a variance for a second driveway. And that was taken away. And he's right, it looks look horrible. You've got this slab out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and uh, it, it looks bad. Um, part of my frustration back then when they were in curves and gutters is if they wanted to have everyone, if they wanted to restrict everyone to one driveway or had you apply for another variance, then that should have been stated. That should have been clearly <coughs> communicated. And it wasn't communicated to any of the residents until they came with the cement trucks and started their work. So I. Yeah, I, I know the frustration. I've, I've experienced it. I've talked to my neighbors. Uh, very frustrated. And it is corrected now. Um, and actually, the uh, horseshoe driveway on Terrace, that was the reason uh, that family brought it up is because for them, that was a safety issue. Right there on the corner of Terrace and Ione, the school is right 
is, is one house away. And his issue was, I can't see when I'm backing out. I don't know if there's a kid there. I don't know if there's a family walking by. With the horseshoe, I can at least come around and I can see down the sidewalk who's coming. And I thought it was very, it made perfect sense. Um, I think it, going forward, if we have ordinances against horseshoes and, and people want to you know, apply a variance, um, I, I think it really depends on the circumstances and the situation. If it's a safety issue, um, and, and it's clearly stated, understood what the safety issue is as to why they need the horseshoe, um, and their neighbors are okay with it, I don't see why it, it, it shouldn't be allowed. Um, uh, Jason? Uh, well, this, <laughs> I'm a non-conforming driveway. I'm a non-conforming house and I'm a non-conforming garage. Uh, in tearing down my garage, uh, they asked me if I wanted to apply for a variance for a five foot setback from the property line. Because uh, I'm currently only 20 feet from my garage. I have a detached garage. I looked at my backyard, I looked at where my garage was and said, nope, let's push back five feet. So in my situation, I was able to resolve it by literally looking at it and going, I'm, I'm losing five feet of backyard. You know what? Let's create a new project out of it. I could have applied for a variance, and I most likely would have been granted it. Um, but at this time, I looked at the, the design and the layout. I, I've always <coughs> had a short driveway. My truck, the rear end, sticks out over the apron. Plow truck comes by, pushes snow up, and blocks me completely in. I don't even have any running room to get up. Uh, special situation. I looked at it, evaluated it, and said, nope, I'm not going to do it. The horseshoe driveways are the same respect. This is why they were finally given after the fight. Um, the gentleman you're talking about, John Troga, got 425 names of people in the area that said, hey, we don't care. We, we think you should keep it. They were willing to stand up for him and allow him to have that horseshoe driveway. Now, he was standing up for more than just himself. He was standing up for the 16 driveways in Spring Lake Park that have that similar situation, hooks and curves and J's, he stood up for it and said, hey, what do it? The result, apply for a variance. If you're a non-conforming garage or driveway or situation, you're allowed to apply for a variance, and the variance committee and the council will then make a decision on it. I think that it was unfortunate that he had to go through as much as he did to get that kind of enforcement. I think that when it comes to special circumstances and certain situations, it shouldn't be that difficult. You shouldn't have to go out and pound the pavement and get as 400 signatures to get something passed or changed, or even the right to apply for a variance because you don't fit in the city's new plan for curb and gutter. Um, the curb and gutter situation, they said, well, yeah, we've had it posted for a year. And it wasn't posted at their house. It was posted on the wall here. So if you had walked by to pay your water bill, if you didn't see it, you didn't know it was there. Everybody has a reason, but again, safety issues, I mean, this is definitely foremost on people's mind. Uh, he did have a very good argument for a situation, but so does everyone else with a non-conforming garage. The University Avenue uh, service road, you have short driveways that are 12 and a half feet long to the apron. They're shorter than mine. I was at least lucky enough to have 20 feet. But if this person ever adds onto their garage, they can do so in a non-conforming way with a variance. Is it best or safe for them to do it? I'm not the council person sitting there looking at the variance. And on a case-by-case -case basis, that's what we do. We apply for variances in the city to get allowances for that. All right, um, and our final question of the evening. Uh, and this is a more of a thinker, but we'll hopefully mm -hmm. see if we get off the cuff for it. Um, we're going to go Tony, Jason, Bob, and Larry for the, for the order. Um, being a member of the city council shapes the community we live in for generations to come. What would you say your 30 year vision for the community and its residents is? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I keep writing down. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> 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 Stop. <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> that you know, it's it's knowing that we're ninety eight percent developed. It, it's tough to um, throw development out there as 
as, especially on the land part, as a uh, as a thirty year plan. Um, thirty years from now, I I hope to see my children and grandchildren want to come back to Spring Lake Park because they've had a wonderful time here. I would love to see Spring Lake Park become a community where um, uh, you know, when a house goes up for sale, it doesn't stay on the market very long because people just enjoy being in the community. Whether that's because of our parks, uh, the schools that we have, the uh, wonderful residents uh, and neighbors that we have here in Spring Lake Park. Um, my vision is that uh, it does become the place to live. Um, I believe we have a lot to offer. Um, how do we build on what we have? Um, it's hard to say uh, 30 years from now because things are changing so rapidly now. Um, technology is just one example of how quickly things are changing and, and just the, introdu the introduction of technology into our lives have even changed our neighborhoods and how we interact with our neighbors. Um, but uh, I, I always envision that um, Spring Lake Park will be the place I'll, I, I live now, will be the place I'll retire and, God forbid, die. <laughs> but it's, it's inevitable. But um, coming from a small farming community, uh, not too small, but uh, it, it's, it was bigger than Spring Lake Park, but it still had that small town feel. Uh, like what I have here at Spring Lake Park, and that's, you know, for me, this is home. It reminds me of my hometown. Uh, so, 30 years from now, um, hopefully, this is the, the place where people want to come and houses don't stay on the market very long. All right, thanks. Uh, Jason? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, during some of the research and reading that I've done, uh, I, I went back and found one of the original uh, comprehensive plans in 1970 for Spring Lake Park compared it to the 2010 comprehensive study for the year 2030, which was required by the Met Council. Um, they were very similar. <coughs> Not a whole lot has changed in Spring Lake Park in, well, 42 years, uh, since that first future plan of what was going to happen. And at the time, the projections were we were going to have 220 new homes built in Spring Lake Park. And that was in 1970. The projection for the 2010 means that we're going to have another 200. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. 200 is the projection of new homes built in Spring Lake Park. Um, and they're talking about townhouses and multifamily districting. That sort of household number hasn't changed since 1970. We're talking a matter of 60 years. And then the idea that we are a small community, but we're not small. We have accessible services to five different cities within a mile from where we are. Uh, we have the greatest potential to house people that can work and live here in the city, but to have a place that is the first ring suburb to the large cities, that if you are working in the city. I think that we need to work on reinventing Spring Lake Park as a place not to just sort of drive through on 65 and 47, uh, as a place to stop. I mean, things that we need to bring in is larger items that attract larger groups of people who want to live here. There is a large population of people who have been here a very long time. But the average age of people moving into the city now is 35 to 50 years old. The mean age has changed. We have younger people moving back into the city and we don't have enough of the informational technology <coughs> items that they're searching for in their properties. So investing in some of the foreclosure homes, the vacant properties, and allowing even tax credits to upgrade these properties so that they are more attractive. Those are the things that I would be looking at trying to spice up the houses we already have here at Spring Lake Park. Okay. Thanks, uh, Don. Well, uh, a lot of the insanity, you know, we are 98% developed. I think we have to take into account of what changing architecture of building has and how residents can adapt the houses that they're living in. Whether it's having a 12-12 uh, pitch on a garage, uh, I don't know where this house height came from, and you have to redo your whole house to put in a garage that now meets the new standards of building and, and the people storing their stuff. 
uh, in a Trumps. I mean, I, I thought it was unfair for some that could have it, some that can't. Uh, you're still in bad economic times. You have children with their children moving back in with their mom and dad because they lost their house. Trying to keep this all viable, let the city grow, let these people uh, remodel their houses, build their houses to where the fit, which in turn brings that price of that house up, which in turn is an increase in property taxes, which helps the city maintain and survive. It would be nice to have a better EDA in HRA, but the Economic Development Authority that we did start with the county and get some of our storefronts, our arterial highways, some money invested in those storefronts or bought out in new storefronts. So we have some of the, what I always call the shiny bottles that the plane is getting up on Highway 65 to make it attractable to what Jason kind of said to where they want to stop here. I want to live here. We have a beautiful school. We have all of that. That's part of it. Now we need some of the rest of it. But being fully developed to achieve this is very hard. And I think we to the business community, the Chamber of Commerce, and how we can start modifying some of our arterial highways that go through the city to bring it in and make it look more vibrant and make people want to move here to the city. Thanks, uh, Larry. Well, uh, I've been living here 30 years. So uh, I look back at the 30 years that I've been living here, and I, and I say to myself, what really attracted me to Spring Lake Park? I think maybe 30 years from now, you know, somebody, you know, probably going to look at it the same way. But what, what really attracted me here was the school district, the school, the parks, and the community. It was small. It was a smaller suburb that I wanted to live in with a smaller community. I think uh, uh, I know that when, when we moved here. Um, we know there's a smaller uh, police department at that particular time, but that seems to have grown. So I think safety is the number one thing here that you want to continue in, in, in the future and in a long range, long range plan. I think you want to continue with the parks programs and park and recreation <coughs> programs. But I think as a retiree, I still want to be able to afford to live here. You know, so I think by looking at, at that, you know, is it going to be is, with my fixed income, is it going to be where the taxes are going to be so high where I'm going to have to move away? You know, I don't want that to happen. I'd like to be able to see some mm -hmm. uh, 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 retirement housing in a particular area that would be able to allow me to stay in the community if I couldn't live in my home anymore. So uh, uh, I want my kids to come back to Spring Lake Park and live in Spring Lake Park. And I think. Uh, um, I know one of them well, because he's still living with my grandma. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's a lot of house. But, uh, uh, the, uh, the kids that we raised in this particular area uh, uh, have turned out fantastic. And the reason that they turned out fantastic was because of the school district and the teachers and the educators that they had gone through from the elementary school through the high schools. And all the programs that were that, that was provided them over the course of time, uh, they've all gone on in, 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 in their own educational fields of uh, professionalism that they're in right now, and uh, I, I contribute that to the fact that Spring Life Park offered them uh, a better life in the future. And uh, I think in a, a thirty-year plan right now, I think uh, if we can offer the same thing, I think that would be a goal. Thank you, and um, that's all we have for questions, so I think we'll do closing comments, and uh, just if we can keep it to one minute per candidate. Um, we're going to do this in the order of Bob, Larry, Jason, and Tom. Closing comments. Well, I've got a lot of experience in here being elected twice. Um, a lot of the learning curve I've already achieved. Uh, I love to talk with the residents and the people at Spring Lake Park, business owners, the rest of it, I feel that if I'm elected now, I can jump in and take care of business right away, do it, use all the past 10 years of, of office to benefit the citizens right away. Um, no most of the laws, the statutes, so if I'm elected, I don't think there'll be a law. And we can take care of business, get things going, and hopefully keep this the greatest community that uh, there ever is. I mean, I was born here. I lived in the house I was born in, and uh, I moved. And uh, it's just a fantastic place to live, and that's what we got to cherish and keep. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Larry, Jason, and Tom. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Larry? Well, like I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm retired. I've got time on my hands. Um, uh, like I said, the, uh, one of the gifts that I, that I received was what this community had to offer my children. Um, uh, I thought to myself, and I asked my wife the same question, you know, she said, you know, why do you want to, why do you want to run for city council? Well, not only do I have time, but I'd like to give back a little bit of what I took. Um, um, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, I, I spent the majority of my time as a working individual, uh, uh, and I had three goals at that particular time, and that was family, family, and family. Um, uh, they're all gone now. Of course, they've all moved on except for the last one I mentioned. Really <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be going on very shortly. Uh, um, I got the opportunity to provide more than coming to the city council meeting twice a month. I want to get involved with the community, and I want to be able to give back what I was doing, what I took from them before. So that's pretty much the one to do. Thank you, uh, Jason. Well, uh, I'm going to go with uh, the endorsement of Larry. I mean, I was, I was, I was raised here, and uh, and if we're basing it upon the fact that I I grew up here. Uh, we moved in from uh, just nearby Fridley. Uh, my grandparents lived in uh, 87th uh, in Blaine. Uh, so I've been in this area my entire life, um, but I became a resident when I was 10 years old. Uh, so I, I grew up, I, I walked to school. Uh, we didn't have the busing system. And I've, I've watched the city grow through the school district also as being, being away. And when I went away to college, I gained a greater appreciation. I went to a small town college of Rhode Island, uh, the smallest of all. Uh, and I liked the small town feel of the college I went to. And when I looked back, I moved into a place in Hamlet. Uh I liked it. It was rural. Um, and I began to notice that it took 15 minutes to get to the gas station. So for me, the advantage to move back to a place I already knew, I already knew a good majority of the neighbors and in the residence areas, his, his children are, live two blocks, they're two houses from me, and we grew up together. It's, we went to school together. Uh, and everywhere I look around Spring Lake Park, a lot of my classmates have started to move back. Uh, Dale Dahl is one of them. I mean, he bought, built a house right here in Spring Lake Park and is a city council member. Uh, it's a great testament to the time that we've spent here growing up and seeing why we want to stay here. And that's why I want to be a council member. I want to help keep that idea that this is the place we want to grow up in. It doesn't matter if you're 50, 60, or 90 years old. You're still growing up here in Spring Lake Park. It's not over yet. Okay. Thanks, uh, Jason and Tony. Of course, being the, as far as years here in Spring Lake Park, I'm the youngest with 17. Um, boy, that seems really young. <laughs> um, but hopefully with that uh, young, ex young experience uh, will come some fresh new ideas for Spring Lake Park. Um, my wife and I enjoy living here. We've been here for uh, me 17 years, my wife 20 years. Um, had no plans of, of moving, several opportunities, but um, being centrally located to so many services and facilities and businesses and uh, having such an excellent uh, education system here in Spring Lake Park and just seeing what the city has done uh, actually what they not so much what they haven't invested in but looking around at what they have invested in which has to do with the people of Spring Lake Park I want to be a part of that and, and being on the council is an opportunity for me to step in and be a part of that and, and to help uh, shape the future and help Spring Lake Park grow uh, not just for uh, me or, or the uh, older residents here at Spring Lake Park, but also thinking about the future residents of Spring Lake Park, the, the younger ones that are coming behind us, uh, giving them a, a community that they can be comfortable in, safe in, and, and proud of. All right. Well, thanks. I'd like to thank the candidates for coming. Thank you all for coming. Yes, it was a great job. <laughs> it was great. Yes. 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 Y